Hi, and welcome to our podcast, Conversations with B'nai B'rith. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Today, I'll be delving into the world of Yiddish theater in America, including the newly restored 1939 Yiddish language film, Mothers of Today, with Dr. Nama Sandra, author, lecturer, and authority on the Yiddish theater. But first, if you enjoy this program, subscribe to Conversations with B'nai B'rith wherever you get your podcasts, and leave us a rating. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook for all of our latest content. Yiddish theater in America stands as a vibrant cultural phenomenon that blossomed alongside the waves of Jewish immigrants arriving in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Rooted in the rich traditions of Eastern European Jewish culture, Yiddish theater emerged as a vital form of entertainment, education, and cultural expression for Jewish communities in the United States, New York City in particular, and especially on the Lower East Side. More than just entertainment, Yiddish theater served as a vehicle for social commentary, exploring themes of immigration, assimilation, identity, and the challenges of modernity faced by Jewish immigrants in America. It provided a space for audiences to celebrate their heritage, their language, and traditions while navigating the complexities of their lives in a new place. Despite facing these challenges, including the decline of Yiddish-speaking populations, the legacy of Yiddish theater endures today. My guest is Dr. Nama Sandro. She specializes in Yiddish theater and is here to discuss its profound impact on American culture and Jewish identity, as well as more recent efforts to preserve its rich heritage through archival work, scholarly study, and more. Dr. Nama Sandro is a Yiddish theater expert, writer, lecturer, scholar, and librettist. She's the author of Vagabond Stars, A World History of Yiddish Theater, and two volumes of translations of Yiddish plays. She's also written the librettos for two award-winning off-Broadway musicals and the opera Enemies, A Love Story, all based on Yiddish material. She's written feature articles for the New York Times, the New York Sun, Art News, and more, and has lectured at universities including Harvard and Oxford, as well as the Smithsonian Institution. Dr. Sandro, so nice to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get into Yiddish theater more broadly, uh, it might be best to first define Yiddish cinema. Uh, So what is Yiddish cinema? How does it differ from Yiddish theater? Uh, Can any film, for example, with dialogue translated into Yiddish, whether spoken or displayed in subtitles, be categorized as part of this genre? Oh, well, definitions. If if they do Moliere in English, or if there's an English play in which there are some French people saying, ooh la la, it's still English. But you can argue. You can argue. People that write about the arts... And people that write about Yiddishkeit, for sure, are argue about definitions. Some of the earliest Yiddish films, in fact, were silent films. It was the era of silent films. And they dubbed them in Yiddish. They weren't made by Yiddish-speaking people. They put in Yiddish uh, titles, you know, when it was still written titles. It was silent film. And the most recent... There have been recent films that used Yiddish. Um, there was one about the partisans. Oh, in the last, I'm now blanking on the name, just a, a very few years ago. There is a, a good romantic movie made in Israel about less than 10 years ago called, it's officially a, a Hebrew movie, the title that it's, that it's publicized under is in Hebrew. It's the last love of Laura Adler, and it's about a Yiddish actress. So all the way through, people speak a combination the way those people would. If you were with them, they would probably mix up the two languages. Is that a Yiddish film? Well, there are books about Yiddish cinema, and they list that movie. You can if you want. When did the um, the Yiddish film industry originate in the United States? We know when the movie industry in this country 
uh, began, um, I think it was in Fort Lee, New Jersey, uh, when uh, they would cross the river and, um, and shoot some of the early films. Uh, where did the Yiddish film industry originate here, or did it start in Europe? And were these studios exclusively dedicated to producing movies for immigrant audiences, or were there also films that were intended for general public use? Well, the earliest Yiddish films, as far as we know, depending on how you define Yiddish, of course, because they were silent, was in the Soviet, in the early days of the Soviet Union. And there were probably a lot of them. Bits of some of them have trickled out just in the last few years since since there was more connection with with uh, archives there. And since uh, Evo acquired manuscripts and libraries opened up in the, the Soviet orbit in the last few years. But the Soviet is where the, the first ones probably were made. Here, soon enough, there were audiences in all the immigrant languages. One of the earliest that people know about is there was a... There was a biblical film about Joseph. I mean, the actors were dressed in togas, you know. It was a biblical film. It was the story of Joseph. And they, they, uh, the intertitles were written in Yiddish, but they were probably written in for different audiences in different languages as well. There was certainly an appetite. I mean, one of the one of the ways in which Yiddish theater and Yiddish film are different from all others. I mean, we're almost Pesach. Why is this different from all others? Is that the Italian immigrants, for instance, couldn't satisfy their appetite for the arts from home in their home language by importing Italian films. In, in Yiddish, there was no... Yiddish land, except for what's made in the in the in anywhere in the Yiddish language, and after the war, certainly after 1950, it was what you might call an industry was mostly gone. So that Yiddish has always been shadowed by other kinds of hungers that are not just aesthetic they're also cultural and familial and there's nostalgia and there's longing and there's sorrow all those all those things kind of play around the edges even of the comedies when they were casting for these films um i i assume they just went to the yiddish theater uh to find the the critical mass of of um, yiddish speaking actors is is that correct yeah yeah except that um the Hebrew Actors Union was not certainly in the early years of the Yiddish films until until into the 30s. There was an effort in the Hebrew Actors Union to prevent members from appearing in films because the films were not very good. They were certainly not very professional. There was n no um, stable of technicians. There were a few people that were cameramen or they could hire who were not people who were not from the Yiddish world or people to write screenplays, people to know how to how to handle the film stock. So they were not so professional looking. They looked very much like actors on a stage that they were, a camera had been set up at the proscenium and was recording what it saw. And so actors hesitated to be to perform. But yeah, 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 they were Yiddish actors. Uh, where were these films distributed? Clearly in, in the New York City area, you could you could find a theater uh, uh, running one of these films. Um, but the Jews who were living in the hinterlands, in the Midwest or the South. Well, they mailed which, them, you know, they sent them in the mail. The North America, South America. Eastern Europe, for sure. Warsaw, they in the late 30s, which was the, the best of all Yiddish films, pretty much, most of them. Um, 
they showed in big theaters in Warsaw, as well as in as well as in New York. I know that they sent them in in um, in big cans because I myself gave held the first Yiddish film festival in my living room, and um, I was writing a history of Yiddish theater. And somebody told me, you know, you can go somewhere on West End Avenue, which is not far from where I live. There's this guy who has some Yiddish films and they're in cans, they're nitrate. You know, they're dangerous. They can explode. And they certainly were in bad shape. You know, so I rented a projector, the kind that went around like this. And I invited people. And when the films broke down, I fixed them with scotch tape it was when they were first starting to to um restore yiddish films it was right around the time that the major enterprise to restore them um and by the way nobody came just about i mean i was i was very interested a year or two later it was the first new york film festival and it was a big it was a hot ticket you know people went and i thought oh, where were you it had no, it was low times for Yiddish theater and Yiddish film. It was, nobody really cared. Well, talk to us about the scripts that were used in Yiddish films across all genres, especially what is called Shund, uh, the other one being Kunst. Uh, did audiences perceive these films as melodramatic or over, overly sentimental? akin to uh, contemporary perceptions? And did the writers draw inspiration from the works of authors such as uh, Sholem Aleichem, Y.L. Peretz, uh, Peretz uh, Hirschbein, or even Shakespeare uh, for other plot lines? Well, from art, that's Kunst, to Schunz, which is low, popular, vulgar, it's the... It's a normal range. I mean, we're like everybody else. It, it, um, have you ever looked at the telenovelas in Spanish or the? I mean, it's it's a normal range, and vaudeville, music hall, dumb jokes, music. It's the normal range of any culture. What's interesting is the fact that in Yiddish, the word for the low, shund, is such a freighted word. In English, we just say popular. And then if we're snobs, we say low, maybe. But shund in Yiddish is a real insult. And it, they think, I mean, the theory is that the word is, is derived from the same word for flaying an animal. You know, a, a disgusting process. So, um, but yeah, so the theater went from high to low and the movies went from high to low. So high, yeah, there are some really good movies um, based on, well, there's uh, Greenefelder and the Divic, which are theater plays, but done very well by very good actors and done very well in, in cinema. And then there's uh, Catskill Honeymoon, which is vaudeville acts. And there's and there's uh, Heinzekin Mama's Mama of Today, which is, you know, that's, that's, um, that shouldn't. But is it now, see, we're talking about movies made a century ago, and the there are complications. First of all, the actors in them were not movie actors. That's something maybe I should have said before when you asked where did they get their actors. There really weren't any Yiddish movie actors. So that memoirs always talk about how uh, of, of people that appeared in in movies, Yiddish actors, how they always had how they had to be trained how it was so hard for them to get used to, instead of being on a stage and every gesture has to carry to the second balcony, how they had to compress and be subtle and how hard it was. But it's also true that it's it's a century ago and the, 
the stage conventions were different from now, so that if you see movies, early American movies, American English language movies, they all seem large. Um, I'm leaving out something that you asked. Did it seem melodramatic? Well, again, popular theater, people discovering that they are long lost brother and sister and they love each other, or family drama, or um, sudden death and sudden reversal and sudden discovery. I mean, the Greeks were doing that. And Shakespeare was doing that. Um, Heintige Mamas does it with not much finesse, you know. I mean, the real value of Heintige Mamas that is a historical document, you know. And even then, I mean, people that watch soap operas now, it's not that they exactly believe it, maybe the more simple of them can... I myself am very good at kind of at believing almost anything that I see for the moment, you know, which is my luck because I can enjoy more things than a, than a, a somebody with more evolved tastes. But it's a document. It, it shows the, the kind of melodrama. Who, who wrote the scripts? I mean, it wasn't there was since there was no Yiddish Hollywood. Um, which which was an industry uh, for all kinds, for all kinds of people. So who were these? The f same folks who were writing for the stage were writing these these movie scripts. Some, some. In fact, uh, Dimov and I think Levick. These are names of really good playwrights, fine playwrights. Were called in sometimes, and they wrote screenplays um but often they were you know put together Pachke. there were not that many yiddish films you know and um when it seemed as if there was going to be a yiddish film industry that there were enough people that knew what they were doing in this new art form a new technology it got squashed so there were there weren't that many people to call on. There wasn't time enough, it seems. Yeah. And once we got to 1939, that was it, more or less. Uh, yeah. There wasn't time enough to for that industry to to grow. Uh, but let me ask you another question. So when a film would open in in New York City, um, were there lines around the block of of, of movie goers? Well, there were different kinds of lines. You know, there were, if it, a Yiddish movie, that, especially a new one, that opened in the Bronx or, or Brighton Beach, and I mean, not just in, in Manhattan, not just on the Lower East Side, but around New York, or was sent to Uruguay or Buenos Aires or... And certainly to places in Poland, uh, yeah, they got they got lines. Uh, some of them were incorporated in vaudeville, just just as, just as, as English language musicals did. There was a movie, and then there were stage acts, and then there was a, the movie, and then there were stage acts. Um, the more artistically ambitious movies, the better ones. They had lines sometimes in Manhattan. They had reviews in Variety. They were, and they're good, you know, some of them. They are, they're good. Did certain films diverge from conventional narratives, possibly inspired uh, by the American social problem films of the early 1930s? Um, what what was was that part of the of the process of making relevant statements about Jewish life in America, particularly for working class Jews? Because at that time, there were there was a very large 
sector of our population here that was working class. Yeah, well, a lot of the a lot of movies were set in Eastern Europe. And they were even the ones made by Americans, the ones made by Americans there or made by Americans here. They even for uh for a few of them, they built a, a set that was a shtetl out in the countryside here, Long Island or in in um, New Jersey. Um, but the ones that were set here, even Heintegemam is, is uh, there. There's, I'm thinking of at least one, but I'm sure there are more than one about a strike, strikers. So it's specifically um, political workers' concerns. But even Heinteke Mamas, that's about, I mean, it starts out with um, the, the, the young woman, the daughter. Now, you have to swallow that she just met this guy and she's they're already getting married. But all right, so you swallow... I don't know. You swallow in in uh, in a comedy of errors. You know the Shakespeare. You swallow that they're in the same town and nobody knows. And they're hmm. you swallow that. That's the given. But it's money. It's money. And losing her the 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 cultural influences, the Americanization, that social reality. Who produced these films? Uh, who who. Who under who underwrote um, the uh, the cost of, of these films? Were, were they, again were they the same people uh, who were um, behind um, Yiddish theater presentations? It varied. It varied. There were some people who there was a guy named Sidney Golden. That was his Americanized name. Who managed for years to make to Yiddishize films at market them. A guy named Joseph Seiden, he and then his son were the ones that I rented the, the cans from. He was still going decades later. Um, Morty Schwartz once, uh, he was active in, in uh, Tevye and making that happen. Uh, it was, there were very few and they got their investment money where they could. It was never a big budget, but uh, the better movies had the more money put into them, and they had to hustle for it as best they could. There were a few. It was not like Broadway. Well, shifting gears uh, slightly and moving over to a specific film, uh, share your insights on Mothers of Today, the 1939 film restored by Brandeis University's National Center for Jewish Film. Uh, the film exemplified, I think, the Shun genre. Correct me if I'm wrong. But what distinguishes the film and makes it special? From, from other melodramas. Uh, it's special because, well, first of all, they had to go from films that they had all of. They couldn't restore a film that was fragmented. So that already cut the number down. Uh, that they could work on. Uh, it's special because it's so pure. I mean, it's so uh, silly, but it's such pure emotion. Everything is an extreme. Um, Yiddish actors, I knew actors of that of that era. I was very lucky. I rushed around and interviewed a bunch of them when they were old, most of them. I mean, some died between one interview and the next. And um, one of them, for instance, Celia Adler, who is in a similar kind of film called Wies mein Kind, Where is My Child, in which she loses her child, and then she finds her, he finds her, and she's been in a, in a mental institution. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's all ex outrageous extreme of feelings. She was talking about being on tour in, in, in Uruguay, as it happens. And she said, 
uh, well, it's not, e she said, without ironing, she said, it's not easy having hysterics twice a day, which to us sounds absurd, but um, she meant extremes of emotion. And um, the plots are not that different from plots that people like today. It's the performance, I think, that seems to us so over the top and difficult to, uh, so operatic, so difficult to uh, to go along with. The word in Yiddish is mitfilm, to, to, to feel with, so large. And, and Mama said today, I, I would also say that the, it's family, but melodrama is in all language. And as I say, starting with the Greek tragedies, you know, it comes back to family relationships. But um, I think one reason why mamas and songs about missing your mama and guilt about leaving your mama and, uh, are so particularly potent in Yiddish uh, popular theater and popular music well, the reality is people did leave their mama. I mean, people were, there was an enormous board, burden of guilt in that period. People had left. They'd left their mama and they'd left everything that mama stands for. I mean, here they were, they were working on Shabbos. They were, it was, it, there's a, a, a song, Abrivala the Maman. Um, yes, you're nodding, you know it. So the, the words say, um, it's supposed to be the mother singing to the son. You're going to America and, and you know I want you to be happy and I want you to have a good life. But send me not just a brief, which is a letter, a brief a note, a little letter. And the lyrics say, the verses say that uh, he did for a while and he got married and he had a good life. And... Um, he didn't write so frequently anymore. And eventually he gets a note saying his mom is dead. And he hears her voice begging for a little letter. So that's was, common. Was mother's and, of today. Italian theater as well, by the way, here, Italian-American. Yeah. Was Mothers of Today one of the few films that alluded to how dark things were getting in Europe for the Jews? Gee, that's a good question. You know, I think it is. I think that's very shrewd. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think of others. Mind you, it was in people's minds. But I bet it is. Well, as as we've discussed, uh, again, in 1939, the door just, just shut. But clearly, let's say between... 1933, when Hitler came to power in 1939, things got progressively worse. Um, maybe uh, those films that were made in, in Europe, was Mothers of Today made in the United States or was made yeah, in... made here. So, the best ones, no, not all, but many of the best ones were made in Poland exactly in, the, in those years. Right, right. Exactly in those years by Americans and, and Europeans together. They well, have the, they have this. Yeah, I, I, we can't really have this discussion without talking about one actor that I recall um, because I met her once. Uh, I was working for the Anti Defamation League, and she was honored at a at a luncheon, uh, kind of a Women of Valor uh, program, and that's Molly Pecan, who starred in uh, East and West, one of the earliest surviving Yiddish films. How did she influence? Yiddish movie audiences. I know she was quite popular. Um, and those familiar with her filmography know that she often appeared disguised as a boy or a man. Were these these pants parts uh, a longstanding Yiddish theater tradition? Or did they reveal an aspect of Amali's persona that fueled the comedic plots that her fans just adored? What do you think? Well, the pants rolls. That's it's not just Yiddish theater. I mean, that's old. They did that. It was um, piquant to make a, I don't mean to make a pun on her name, and cute in American theater and European theater in the 19th century. Um, 
you know, there was something about her her persona that is not grown up woman. Um, and so she didn't play men. She played boys, if you notice. Um, and by playing boys, she was able to uh, evoke old country stuff, yeshiva boys. That was her particular shtick. In East and West, then she's supposed to be, yeah, she's supposed to be a, a woman. Um, in uh, Yedel Mitten Friedel, she's specifically a woman. She's playing a man, but it's a, it's a thin disguise. It's the womanhood that, that wins out. She's very popular. Um, you know, she began, her mother, she was born in America. She went to American public schools from her childhood. But her mother was were, was a wardrobe mistress in Yiddish theater. And she began her career in American vaudeville. Um, I think it was the flu, the big flu epidemic that closed down her act. She married Jacob Kalich, who yes. said, your, your Yiddish is not very good. So he took her to Europe to improve her Yiddish, and he was her impresario. I never met her, but I met him. And in fact, I was in their house, and they had a, a little guest house on their property in Westchester, uh, completely papered in posters of hers. He ran away to join Yiddish theater. His parents did not approve. And she went on to DP camps, one of the big moments of her biography. I don't mean her written biography. I mean, although that too, but of her life, if you think about it, is that she was one of the Yiddish actors that went immediately after the war and played in DP camps. And a woman with enormous emotional impact on, on the audiences uh, of survivors. And a woman once showed me a little costume jewelry pin she had. She had the, the emotional genius, evidently, to bring along bags and bags and bags of little costume jewelry. And she gave to these women in the audience. So they had something. I mean, it's, it's very moving, right? You know, it's interesting you mentioned the posters because um, years ago when, when B'nai B'rith was at its um, location here in Washington on Rhode Island Avenue, we had a museum and there was a, gifts, a gift shop. And the gift shop sold um, reproductions of posters um, of her movies. Oh, yeah. um, and, I, and I also remember, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that Kalich had a small part in Fiddler on the Roof in the, in the movie, in the um, theatrical oh, movie. Right. Um, I yeah, I think he was, uh, he was on very briefly and he was a, a Milamed. He was a, a teacher oh, and, yeah. uh, and a very, very small part. But I, I do remember her and, and hearing about uh, um, what a personality she was, celebrity. She had celebrity status uh, in the in the Jewish community. Well, yeah. it's it's um, as we said, Mind it's you, actors all together were very, were celeb. Yeah. All right, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, no. It, it's it's easy to understand why the end of World War II. We've talked about it marked the end of the industry quite abruptly. Um, have there been any efforts to revive it since then? We talked in the beginning about a couple of films. Um, Shtisel, the Israeli uh, TV uh, production, um, the dialogue is in is in Yiddish and was very popular. Um, are there any contemporary that, that we haven't talked about any contemporary Yiddish films or films featuring Yiddish dialogue being produced today? Um, and basically, what do you think the future of Yiddish film looks like? Will there be a rediscovery? Will will there be a? There won't be. A, it won't be widespread. Uh, because um, obviously the number of speakers is, is limited and Jewish community audiences, um, you know, if you count all of us, uh, we're, we're about 15 million worldwide. But what do you see as the future? 
Oh, gee. Yes, there are. We're talking just about movies now, right? Not about theater. Well, we can talk um, about both. Talk about both. Well, theater, I just saw last month a play written all in Yiddish by a young man who learned a lot of his Yiddish in college and after that. Uh, and it was a very interesting play. Um, of course, they do it with super titles. Um, so, yeah, people, people go on making, trying to make combinations. There are groups in Berlin. It, uh, on stage, innovative techniques in theater using uh, video, using music, pantomime, those uh, make an opportunity to use Yiddish. And Yiddish is uh, interesting enough and uh, romantic enough and uh, dead enough. I mean, uh, Yiddish, one holds that Yiddish has nowadays, or in the last years, is that it's a way of holding on to Jewishness while not holding on to Israel. I myself am a Zionist, so I'm trying to say that very tactfully. Um, and in that way, it it has a hold on people's hearts and minds. Uh, and they do some interesting work in Yiddish, as well as translations. In the last few years, there have been translations of Inesco's Rhinoceros did in Yiddish. And if you were waiting for Godot, which played here and played in Ireland, um, and a Beckett festival. Very good. These are very good productions in Yiddish. It was not that long ago uh, that the uh, revival of um, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish in New York yeah. um, went right. on for for months. Um, right. Went to went to a larger venue. Right. Uh, I I attended uh, one of those performances and uh, I was I was very impressed. No, I think I think it is a matter of of trying to hold on to, you said it very well, of trying to hold on to um, this treasure. I, I hope that that people see it that way, that this is a treasure of Jewish history, um, abruptly, not ended, uh, but wounded so badly um, between 1939 and 1945. And yet, here we are still talking about it. And when you, when I hear it, I, I have a, a very good feeling about what I'm what I'm hearing, even though I don't I don't understand all of it. And I think, listen, I think you can uh, you can embrace. I know that that in in Israel, of course, uh, there also was uh, for years. I have a, uh, a cousin by marriage uh, who uh, appeared on the Yiddish stage uh, for a long time in in Israel, and I know there was a, a market for it there. But of course. The idea there was uh, to uh, to build Hebrew culture and, and the Hebrew yeah. language. Yes, uh, but there, there's uh, nowadays, for a while now, there's a, a Yiddish theater, a repertory theater, state theater. And then there are little companies as well that do a show. Some good actors. Well, let's hope that, uh, that it continues. Um, you can find out more about Dr. Namasandro and her work at namasandro.com, spelled out N A H M A S A N D R O W dot C O M. Dr. Sandro, I speak for myself and so many others when I say that your contributions to our understanding of Yiddish theater and culture are invaluable. Thank you again for being here and sharing your insights with us. A pleasure. That's it for today's episode of the Conversations with B'nai B'rith podcast. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Namasandro, for joining us and to you for tuning in to our show. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. Share this episode with others. Post it uh, 
post about it on social media or leave us a comment or a rating. We love hearing from you. For all of our latest content, and if you haven't already, follow or subscribe to Conversations with B'nai B'rith wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Stay tuned for more exciting content on our next episode. Until then, for my guest, Dr. Namasandro, this is your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Take care, everyone.